Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. The test is in 4 part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You are going to listen to the director of a college talking about his school. Listen to the talk and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Many of you already have a reasonably firm idea of the general subject area you wish to study. Others are more open and searching for ideas. Whatever your situation, I hope you find that we have a course that meets your needs. Our firm aim is to be a student-centred institution with a special emphasis on flexibility. This begins with our attitude to access. We judge people on their motivation and commitment to study as much as, if not more than, formal qualifications. This is reflected in the vitality and diversity of our student population. Some of our students come direct from sixth form or college. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Others are coming into higher education after a short or long gap from formal education. Some are seeking a specific set of skills with a particular job or profession in mind. Others are retraining or studying to give their careers a new direction or dimension. Some are learning about the very latest scientific, technological and commercial knowledge. Others are stretching their minds on sensitive environmental, social and cultural issues. Even a casual observation of the mix of our student body indicates that we're close to our aim of being a polytechnic for the whole community. To meet our students' needs, we have 500 academic and a further 500 support staff committed to good quality teaching, high standards and sensitive and sympathetic student care. We have probably the longest experience of understanding and dealing with the differing needs of a diverse student population. I hope you'll find a suitable course at the Polytechnic College if you want to come to the college, and we consider you suitable, we'll do our best to find you a place. And when you're here, we'll work hard to make your experience enjoyable, stimulating and educationally rewarding. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tour guide giving information about a shopping district. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15.
As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 15. This afternoon, we'll visit the city's shopping district. Several blocks in the area are closed to car traffic, and I know you'll enjoy walking around there. I'd like to give you an overview of the district now, since you'll be on your own once we get there. You'll see on this map here that the shopping district consists of two streets, Pear Street, which runs north and south, and Cherry Street, which crosses Pear Street right here. Let's start our tour here on Pear Street, where the star is. This star marks the Harbor View Bookstore. It's very popular among locals as well as tourists. You can buy a range of books of local interest as well as a variety of magazines and newspapers. It's directly across the street from the city library, which is also worth a visit. It's in one of the oldest buildings in the city and contains, among other things, an interesting collection of rare books. Now, moving up Pear from the bookstore toward Cherry, the next building on the left is the Pear Cafe. You'll notice it's right on the corner of Pear and Cherry Streets. It's a great place to relax while enjoying a delicious cup of coffee or tea. You can talk with friends or read quietly. They have a variety of books and magazines available. From the windows of the cafe, you can look right across Cherry Street for a lovely view of city gardens. It's a rather small garden, but it contains a variety of exotic plants and flowers. Let's leave the cafe and cross Pear Street. On the opposite corner, we're at Caldwell's Clothing Store, which you might also want to visit. They sell both men's and women's fashions from countries around the world. Continuing down Cherry Street, the next building on the right, after Caldwell's, is the Souvenir Shop. Stop in here to get maps and books about the local area, as well as t-shirts and postcards with pictures of the city. Now, we cross Cherry Street and we're at the Art Gallery, one building down from the corner. Here you can see, and of course, purchase, many fine paintings and sculptures by local artists. Let's keep going down Cherry Street toward the harbor. On the left, right after the gallery, is Harbor Park. It's a lovely place, and it's certainly worth spending some time there. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Harbor Park was built on land donated to the city by Captain Jones, a lifelong resident of this city. Captain Jones designed the park himself, and it was built in 1876. Exactly in the center of the park, a statue of Captain Jones was erected, and it's still standing there today. It shows Captain Jones on the bow of his ship. After viewing the statue, you can follow the path that goes through the woods just behind. It will lead you to a lovely garden, in the middle of which is a fountain. This is a nice place to enjoy a few quiet moments. If you still feel like walking, continue on to the far end of the garden. There you'll find a wooden staircase which will take you down to the harbor. You might enjoy the view of the boats from there. There's also a walking path along the water which will eventually bring you back up to Cherry Street. 
You can see that there's plenty to do in this part of the city. The bus leaves at 1.30. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about sport in Ireland. First, look at questions 21 to 23. As you listen, answer the questions. Now, today we're going to be finding out about the most popular sports in the Emerald Isle. That's Ireland, of course. Can you guess what they are? Well, there are these two lesser played games, a form of rounders and Gaelic handball. But we'll start with one which is perhaps over 3,000 years old, arriving in Ireland with the Celts, some claim. That may be a slight exaggeration, but I consider it to be the fastest field game in the world, and it goes by the name of hurling. Well, that's what it's known as in the English-speaking world anyway. So, what do you have to do? You've got 15 players on a team, one of them the goalkeeper. Each one has a stick called a hurley. Here you are. I've brought mine along. Had it since I was at school. This is what it looks like, and basically you have to get this ball, called a schlitter, that's S-L-I-O-T-A-R, so it's not spelt the way it's pronounced. You hit it into the net for three points, or you can hit it over the net for one point. The goal looks like the letter H, with the net under the crossbar. The goalie has a bigger stick than the others to help keep the ball out. You can also catch the schlitter and run with it for four steps maximum, or bounce it on your stick. Is that clear to you all? I'll be showing you a video a bit later, so you can see what a game actually looks like. You might like to think of it as a mixture of lacrosse, hockey and baseball. Oh, and it's played by women too but it goes by the name of Komogi in that case. Before the conversation continues, look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen to the second part of the discussion. I'll give you a bit of the history, shall I now? Generally, the golden age of the game is considered to be the 18th century. But systematic rules were first agreed and drawn up at that great shrine of learning, Trinity College Dublin, in 1879, founding the Irish Hurling Union closely followed just a few years later by the formation of the Gaelic Athletics Association. With greater organisation last century, the All-Ireland Hurling Championship got off to a flying start, and I'm proud to say that my own native city of Cork has won more than 20 titles over the years. But then, so have Kilkenny and Tipperary. Is it only played in Ireland? 
No. Well, it is the only country with a national team at the moment. But you may be surprised to discover there are hurling clubs in London, as well as in America and Argentina, to name just a few. The other game I'd like to take a little time to introduce you to is Gaelic football, which is played on the same pitch as hurling with the same number of players. But there's no net. You just have to get the ball over your opponent's goalposts. And you can do that by kicking or punching the ball. However, you're not supposed to do that to the players, I might add. Imagine it as a combination of soccer and basketball. But in my opinion, it's a more exciting spectacle than either of those. Excuse my bias, if you will. It's also very popular with women. In fact, there are more women's teams than for any other sport. Whether despite or because of the physical contact involved, I wouldn't like to say. They do play a shorter game, 60 minutes, rather than the men's 70. So, let's have a look. If we can have the lights down, I'll see if I can get this technology to work. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk about universities and colleges in Britain. As you listen to the talk, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Every year, thousands of young people want to study in Great Britain. They come from a range of backgrounds and have varying expectations of what their study in the country will be like and how to apply to the university. Today, I'd like to talk on universities and colleges in Britain. There are 45 universities 30 polytechnics and about 1,000 major technical, commercial, education and art colleges in the UK. In 1973 to 1974, there were over 251,200 full-time students in universities, of whom almost 10% were from overseas. A total of nearly 276,350 students attending full-time courses in establishments of further education and about 130,270 in colleges of education. University first degree courses in arts and sciences are normally of three or four years duration and, with very few exceptions, Students are not admitted for any shorter period of study. The academic year normally extends from October to June and is divided into three terms. Information about courses and entrance requirements should be obtained by writing direct to the university at least 12 months before the proposed date of admission. All applications for admission are dealt with by the University's Central Council on Admissions, the UCA, 
to which all candidates seeking admission to a full-time internal first degree course or a first diploma course of more than one year's duration must apply. Full details of the admission procedure are to be found in the Ucker Handbook, How to Apply for Admission to a University. A copy of this handbook and the standard application form should be obtained from the Ucker at PO Box 28, Cheltenham and Gloucestershire, GL501HY. The application form must be returned to the UCA by a stated closing date, usually in December, October for Oxford and Cambridge. The UCA will continue to send application forms to universities for consideration at their discretion for a limited period after the 15th of December but candidates are strongly advised to ensure that their application forms reach the UCA by the stated closing date to help their chances of selection. Candidates who fail to obtain a place in the initial selection period are automatically put into the Clearing House scheme in June-July, when these candidates' application forms are again sent to those universities which still have vacancies. Students from the following countries should send their application forms to the UCA via the Overseas Student Office of their own country in London, Bahamas, Brunei, Cyprus, Ghana, Guyana, India, Luxembourg, Singapore, Tanzania, Thailand and Uganda. Graduates of a university in Britain or overseas who wish to take another first degree course should approach the university concerned to require whether it wishes them to apply direct or through the central UCA scheme. Now, let's turn to transfer. It is very rare for a student who has begun a first degree course at one university in Britain to transfer to another British university with a view to completing it there and there is no provision for the automatic granting of credit for university studies already undertaken. Students who have already completed some university-level study should make inquiries directly with the individual university. To be considered for admission, a candidate must show that his earlier education has qualified him to enter the course and that he speaks, writes and understands English sufficiently well. The usual minimum qualifications for entry to a first degree course in a university are good passes in the General Certificate of Education, the British School Leaving Examination, either three passes at ordinary level and two advanced level, or one at ordinary level and three at advanced level. A certificate which gives admission to a university in the candidate's own country will be taken into consideration for admission to a British university. But a university may still require passes in some subjects of the GCE, or an equivalent examination. It should be noted that possession of the minimum entrance requirements does not guarantee admission. Selection is competitive and each application is judged on its merits. The British Council officers overseas and the school's council 160 Great Portland Street, London W1N 6LL, are prepared to offer advice on the acceptability of specific overseas qualifications in place of the British General Certificate of Education. A copy of the original certificate and, where appropriate, an approved translation should accompany all inquiries. That is the end of Part 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.